Welcome to another Tech Help video brought to you by AccessLearningZone.com. I'm your instructor, Richard Rost. It's about that time again, folks. Time for another quick queries video where I take all the questions you guys send me that don't necessarily need a full video on their own, and I put them all together, and we do that, and it's called Quick Queries. This is episode 20. Hard to believe I've done 20 of these already. Well, doing 20 of them now. Anyways, let's get to it. First up, I get a lot of people asking me about this one. Why don't I like the lookup wizard? Why don't I like using lookup fields and tables? And I explain why in this video about the lookup wizard. It's that it's not proper normalization. It's not proper database development to have lookup lists inside of a table. It's just not how it's supposed to be. So you have a regular table like your customer T. And if you want to look up some stuff for a list like titles or suffixes, prefixes, junior stuff, you know, that kind of stuff. That should be in a separate table. That's just how databases are designed to work. You don't want lookup lists inside of tables. And then later on, when you do get into programming and development and you want to be able to programmatically work with that data, it's near impossible if it's stored inside of a lookup list inside of a table. Now, as far as your question goes, as far as hearing a degree of opposition against lookup functions using a dedicated external table, some people think it will corrupt the database. Now, if what you're talking about is a lookup function, like putting a DLOOKUP inside of, say, a query, I generally recommend against that because for each record in that query, you have to perform a DLOOKUP on another table. Is it going to corrupt the database? No, probably not. But in fact, most definitely not. But it's going to be slow. It's going to slow things down. You're better off with a join. If you've got like customers, and again, let's go with uh, with suffixes, right? Senior, junior, third. You want to look that up in a table based on an ID. Don't use a DLOOKUP or any other kind of D function, D count, D sum, D max. Don't use those in queries. Okay? Use a join if you can and join the other table in. But it's not it's not for corruption purposes. It's just it's just for speed mostly. Corruption issues in Access are usually caused by things like improper shutdowns. That's the number one thing, right? Your computer locks up and Access doesn't shut down right. Um, super large file sizes. Two gigabytes is a limit, but if your database is over a gig, you should really start thinking about splitting it. Um, network issues can cause corruptions. Um, some of the recent Access versions that have bugs in them can cause corruptions. So that's why it's important to back up, back up, back up, back up. Every night, back up. Every time you make any important changes, back up. Always run backups. But no, you don't have to worry about lookup functions. But lookup functions are best if you're doing them for like one or a small group of records. Like you want to de look up something like on a form. Okay. Putting putting lookup functions in queries can slow things down depending on the number of records you got. That's why joins are better. I've actually got a tech help video on my list uh, called usejoins.dlookup. It's been on there for a while, so look for a video on this topic coming out pretty soon to a store near you. No, <laughs> no, it'll be out pretty soon, so keep an eye out for it. Next up, Gary, one of my gold members, says, Is it a best practice to release temp bars at the end of a function when you're done with them? Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. You, I mean, you, you can. That's one of those things that temp bars have a life cycle of the entire database. All right, so once you declare a temp var, it's going to be in use the whole time. So unless you're concerned about memory, I really, I mean, which unless you're using tons and tons of temp vars, I wouldn't worry too much about it. But down here, like, like I say, in a perfect database, you could destroy the temp vars when you're done with them. It's temp vars dot remove and then your temp variable name or remove all. But again, you know, computers nowadays have so much memory that this should not be a problem unless you're using tens of thousands of temp bars, which I wouldn't do. Temp bar, usually we use temp bars, like maybe a dozen of them over the course of the database's lifetime. So, you know, and of course, Adam loves temp bars. So is, is this something you, sh you can do? Sure. Do you have to? I wouldn't worry about it, honestly, unless you've got a reason to destroy it, unless you've got a reason why you don't want it around anymore. Okay. Next up, this one isn't so much a query. It's a tip from one of our moderators, Kevin. He says, if you're not keen, I love that word keen. If you're not keen on the new default theme and colors for access, you can revert back to the 2013, 2022 theme with Calibri. Go to file options, client settings, scroll down to the bottom, and there's a checkbox right down there on the bottom. Let's get it down there so you can see it right down there. Use office 2013, 
2022 theme. There you go. I personally, and I, I mentioned this in there, I personally just use copies of older databases when I make new ones. So I don't remember the last time I created a new database file. I always keep using the tech help free template and then working off of that. And so that's got the template that I like. So yeah. And of course, Kevin Yip's got some other ideas in here too. So check it out. There's the link. Where's the link? There's the link right there. I'll put it down below. Next up, Eve wants to know, how do you have multiple CSV files or any kind of file, text files, whatever, uh, get imported every time that one is added to the folder. So if you want it to happen automatically, then your database is going to have to be running like on a loop, right? Like it sits there and it's running and it's just waiting for files to be put in this folder. Or you can do it with a button. You click the button and it imports whatever it finds in the folder. Um, at the time that I wrote this, I said, I've got a video coming out soon that shows something similar, how to import any pictures that happen to be dropped into a folder. And I do have that video available. It's this guy. It's a four-part series, how to load multiple images, right? You've got images for a customer. You click the import button and it just pulls in whatever images it finds in your images folder and it imports them into the database. Well, it saves their file names and locations and stuff in the database and then moves them to a separate folder. You could do the same thing very easily with text files. Just instead of an import, you would be um, you would be running your your instead of importing the names of the files, you would just be importing the data with the whatever import code you want to use. So, is it possible? Absolutely. Up next again is another tip coming from Matt Hall, one of our Platinum members. It's talking about moving things around on a form in Design View. Right, without the moist, the moist, <laughs> the mouse pointer getting in the way. Right, arrow keys move the object. Control arrow keys move the object in small increments. Shift arrow keys shrink and stretch, and Control Shift arrow shrink and stretch in small increments. That's fantastic. It's much more uh, user friendly than using the mouse. I hate trying to get the controls on the little tiny grid dots, and uh, yeah. But the, my, my problem is I always forget to use these. And these are fantastic. I always forget them, so I just sit there and struggle with the mouse. I, uh, I sometimes use my screen magnifier and just zoom in. So, uh, yeah, that's a, a great tip. Thanks, Matt. And I, uh, I love for Matt's profile picture. He's got my website in the background. <laughs> that's awesome. <laughs> All right, this is a good one, and I wanted to point this out because this comes up once in a while, and I give credit to Sammy, one of our moderators, for helping Mohammed with this one. He says he's got two date fields in his database. Both are formatted like this. But only the first date shows in the correct format, while the second still shows up like that. All right. First of all, I have to use this as an opportunity for advertising the ISO date format. It is one of my missions in life to get everyone around the world to switch to this date format. It's the only one that makes sense. It's the best one for computers. So do it. I got world peace and then ISO date format. And I'm getting rid of daylight saving time. I hate daylight saving time. But anyways, this is one of my things I want to see everyone do. And of course, switching to metric, but that'll never happen in my lifetime. Anyways, so Sammy walks Muhammad through this very carefully. Here's what you can see it looks like in the form, right? Okay. Then he says, show me the tables. All right, so here's the table. The date start in the table. He's got his format right there. Okay. Here's date end in the format. There, there, there it is right there. It looks good. Everything looks good. See, this is why I tell people to post it in the forums with some screenshots. Because then we can see what's going on. Right, just from your description, uh, with just text, we can't tell. All right, now he wants to see, check out the forms. All right, here's the forms. All right, there's his data tabs, but don't get fooled because it says text format here, but that's not the format. That's text format. It's either plain text or rich text. You don't want that. All right, and Sammy says, okay, this is the data tab. I want to see the format tab. So we see the format tab. All right, and here it is, the format tab. All right, format. Oh, look at that. It's, it's right there. This one's missing it. Okay. So even though you've got the format in the table, okay, the form might not have it. And the form will always override the table. What probably happened here was he built the table, didn't have the formats in it, then built the form, then went back and added the formats to the table at that point. Because when you build a form, it will inherit the formats at that point, right? At the moment that you build the form. But if you go back and change the format in the table, that doesn't propagate down to the forms and reports that are based on it. So you gotta make sure you check the format tab and the format property for each of the 
controls you want to change. Okay. And then he got it. So shout out and thanks to Sammy for taking his time to help out Mohammed with this one. And that's fantastic. Thank you. And this comes up a lot. This is one of those things that I, you know, I talk about in my classes too. So you got to be careful with your formats. Here's one I see a lot. This one comes from Larry, one of my gold members. He's got command buttons in his database, and he wants to change those names so that they match the names in my videos. He's got command 10 and command 13, whereas in the video, it's command 9 and command 12. And he has no idea how this happened. Well, see, what happens is whenever you add a control to a form, it gets the next number. So it could be command 10, command 15, whatever the next numbered control is in your form. These numbers are completely arbitrary. You don't need to worry about what they are. Generally, I never refer to a command button in code unless I'm changing one of its properties, like changing uh, the caption or the color of the button, right? Then I'll say like, you know, command 10 dot caption equals hello there or whatever, okay? But what I tried to do, and Alex, my, my good friend and colleague, Alex, he got me on this a few years ago because I never used to bother naming my buttons. I didn't. But now I try to because it does make sense when you're going through the code. Try to name them something meaningful like send email button or open customer button. Okay, but you have to be careful because if you rename the button, it usually will break it from its code. This is one of my pet peeves in Access, and I wish the Access team would fix this. If you're in your database, right, if you create a new button, it's command 10, whatever. As soon as you create it, before you put any code in it, give it a good name. Like I called mine hello world button here. All right. And if you right click and go to build event, you'll see that there's some code in that hello world button. Okay. But if you come over here and you change this right to like new button name or whatever, you've now broken the link between that button and its code. Okay. So you have to right click on it, go to build event. And look, I'm down here in new button name. All right, see all that? So what you got to do is then find the code that was in your old button, cut it out, paste it in here. All right, obviously you want to indent that because indenting is important. And then you can delete this old shell, the old subroutine. So be careful when you do that. You don't want to break your code. And then renaming your objects does. Sometimes if you rename stuff, it does propagate down through the database. If you rename a field in a table, most of the time, not 100% of the time, most of the time, any queries, forms, whatever that have uh, that field linked to that table field, it usually will rename it, but it doesn't always. So be careful. So try to get your names right the first time <laughs> because going through and fixing these things afterwards is a pain. But the Visual Basic Editor will definitely not rename your objects for you. And again, the only thing, I mean, as far as assigning names goes, if you copy and paste a button, all right, see, no, notice now it's Command 16. That means it's the 16th control on this. And if you go to put some code in here, this is what I used to do. I used to come in here and be like, you know, message box, this is some code, right? Um, you're not going to ever really need to refer to command 16 click anywhere else. So this is fine. Sometimes what I would do is put in here like, you know, this is the new button that does whatever. Just so when I'm reading through the code, I can tell what this button is. But Alex is right. You should give your buttons good names uh, up front. Right? As soon as you create this button, give it a good name, right? My other new button. Obviously, you'll call it whatever it is, open customer form or whatever. All right, but now once you've done that, again, notice I've broken the link to my code. Right? So you got to go find that code. Here it is. Cut this out. Delete this. Come back down here and then paste it in. And now you're fixed. So just be aware of that. Okay? Okay. But... As far as command 10, command 13 versus command 9, 12, it shouldn't matter. It doesn't matter. This is an older seminar too, my email seminar. So this is this was back, what, 10, 15 years ago before I was in the habit of naming my buttons properly. But uh, you don't got to worry about it. Here's another one that comes up frequently. Um, I use this little box here a lot when I bring up form properties. And uh, sometimes people say, hey, I, I can't find them. I've lost that little box and I've lost my rulers. What happened? Well, Scott found it, right? Under arrange, go to size space and then the little ruler icons right down there. All right, so it's, where is it? Here it is, see, I lost it, it's gone. No rulers, no box, All right? Go under the arrange tab, size and space and there's ruler, pink, and there it is. turns it back on. You got your rulers and you got your little 
box there you can double click to bring up the properties for the form. See that? A lot of people lose their grid too. It's like, why well, don't I have a grid? Well, that's right there. And I got a whole separate video on why you might see grid lines versus grid dots. It has to do with where you are. This, this is an old one. This goes back before I was even doing tech help videos. This is my old tips and tricks section. Right? Well, this video here will explain how to turn grid lines into grid dots. I'll put a link to this one down below. Here's another tip. This one from Adam, one of our moderators. He's uh, got code here to convert a form to a report. I haven't tried it yet myself, but Adam is usually very reliable with the code that he produces. So uh, if you got a form and you want to copy everything over and do a report, this looks like it does pretty much that. So check it out. Ludwig, let me know if you tried it, if it works. Um, yeah, okay, cool. Next up's a question from Donald, one of my gold members. He says he's discovering from employees that they might be shortcutting some data entry on some important forms. Is there a way to verify that required fields have data entered before letting an employee commit the form to the database? So, of course, Alex brought up the required video, which this will definitely show you how to set up a field so it is required, so the users have to put something in there. But of course, and I mentioned this a lot, I think even in that video, no data is better than bad data. Right, if you've got something like a phone number and you require it and the user has to put it in, but the customer's already left and they forgot to get it, they're gonna put in there, you know, two, three, nine, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, or whatever, because they have to in order to save the record. But now you can't tell, you know, you can't generate an easy list of, you know, here are the people that we didn't get their phone numbers, let's contact them, let's, I don't know, send them something in the mail to get their phone numbers. You, you got a bunch of bad data, you got, you got garbage in your database. So don't make something required unless it's actually really seriously required, okay? And if it's something that involves multiple fields, you can also look into table level validation, right? This allows you to look at the values in multiple fields to determine if the data is valid or not, not just a single field, okay? Kenneth asks, he's just curious, why can't you set all of your note fields, your long text fields to rich text all the time? In my van, it's all rush all the time. No, um, you, you can if you want to. Um, I generally don't unless I really need that formatting, if I need to be able to bold something or something like that. Because um, usually if you're going to be doing any kind of exporting or whatever, sometimes you know the, whatever you're exporting them to doesn't like the HTML tags. So it's really, this is just a matter of personal preference. If you need it, great. If you want it, just be aware that it's it's, it's harder to strip out those HTML tags later if you, if you don't need them and you put them in there anyways. Next up, James has a comment on uh, my A to Z jump buttons video. And in case you forgot about this one, it's where I put a bunch of letters across the top. I just did A, M, and R, but you can go all the way through Z if you want to. You click on it and it jumps down to that location in the list, okay? James has an idea where he uses the filter property. Right, let me put that in a minute, right there. The filter property, right, and the like, and then he just filters the list so that you only see those records. And that's a great idea. That's definitely another option for you, especially if you got tons and tons and tons of records. Instead of moving down to that location, um, you know, you might be better off filtering the list to, to you know, show us short a smaller list. You can use this, or you can actually change the record source for the wear condition. There's lots of things you can do. I love playing with all these Legos. Millions of different solutions, but I figured I'd share this with everybody. Thank you, James, for the tip. Well, that's going to about do it for today, folks. If you've got questions you want to see answered, post them in the forums on my website. And even if you're not a student, I've got a visitor forum. You can go to the visitor forum post there. Um, I do try to read all the, the comments that are posted on my YouTube channel, but there's a lot of them. So I can't promise everybody a personal reply. But if it's a good question, I might include it in a quick queries video or make a tech help video for you. I don't know. Uh, do members get priority? Yeah, they do. But if I see a good question, I'm all about answering good questions. Doesn't matter who you are. <laughs> all right. So there's your tech help quick queries video for today. I hope you learned something. Live long and prosper, my friends. I'll see you next time. A special thank you and shout out to our diamond sponsors. First, we have Juan Soto with Access Experts Software Solutions, manufacturing experts specializing in Access and SQL Server. Juan is a 13-time Microsoft Access MVP. You can check them out at accessexperts.com. Another shout out to Sammy Shama from Shama Consultancy. Sammy is a certified Microsoft Office specialist. 
and he not only offers access application development, but he also provides one-on-one -on -one tutoring services. So if you need someone to hold your hand and help you with your access project, Sammy is your guy. Check him out at shamaconsultancy.com. If you enjoyed this video, please give me a thumbs up and post any comments you may have below. I do try to read and answer all of them as soon as I can. Make sure you subscribe to my channel, which is completely free. Click the bell icon and select all to receive notifications when new videos are posted. Want to learn more? Click the show more link below the video to find additional resources and links. YouTube does a pretty good job of hiding it. It's right down there. See this part of the description here, right? The name, the videos up here. There's a little show more down there, right down the bottom. It's kind of hard to find. But once you click on that, you'll see a list of other videos, additional information related to the current topic, free lessons, and lots more. And YouTube no longer sends out email notifications when new videos are posted like they used to do. But if you'd like to get an email every time I post a new video, click on the link to join my mailing list. And you can pick how frequently to get emails from me, either as they happen daily, weekly, or monthly. Now, if you'd like to become a paid member of my channel and receive all kinds of awesome perks, click on the join button. You'll see a list of all the different membership levels that are available, each with its own special perks, including my extended cut videos, access to my code vault, lots of VBA source code in there, template downloads, and lots more. I'll talk more about these perks at the end of the video. Even if you don't want to commit to becoming a paid member, and you'd like to help support my work, please feel free to click on the tip jar link. Your patronage is greatly appreciated and will help keep these free videos coming. I got some puppies to feed. But don't worry, no matter what, these free tech help videos are going to keep coming. As long as you keep watching them, I'll keep making more and they'll always be free. Now, if you really want to learn access and you haven't tried my free access level one course, check it out now. It covers all the basics of Microsoft Access, including building forms, queries, reports, and more. It's over four hours long. You could find it on my website or on my YouTube channel. I'll put a link down below you can click on. And did I mention it's completely free? The whole thing, free, four hours, go watch it. And okay, okay, a lot of you have told me that you don't have time to sit through a four hour course. So I do now have a quicker Microsoft Access for Beginners video that covers all the basics faster in about 30 minutes. And no, I didn't just put the video on fast forward, <laughs> but I'll put a link to this down below as well. Now, if you like level one, level two is just a dollar. That's it, one dollar. And that's another whole like 90 minute course. Level two is also free for paid members of any level, including supporters. So if you're a member, go watch level two, it's free. Okay, want to get your question answered in a video just like this one? Visit my tech help page and send me your question there. Members get priority, of course. While I do try to read and respond to all of the comments posted below in the comments section, I only have time to go through them briefly a couple of times a month, and sometimes I get thousands of them. So send me your question here on the tech help page, and you'll have a better chance of getting it answered. And while you're on my website, be sure to stop by my Access Forum. We've got lots of lively conversations about Microsoft Access and other topics. I have a fantastic group of moderators who help me answer questions. Shout out to Alex, Kevin, Scott, Adam, John, Dan, Juan, and everybody else who helps out on the site. I appreciate everything you do. I couldn't do it without you. Be sure to follow my blog, find me on Twitter, and of course on YouTube. Yeah, I'm on Facebook too, but I don't like Facebook. Don't get me started. Now, let's talk more about those member perks. If you do decide to join as a paid member, there are different levels, silver, gold, platinum, and diamond. Silver members and up get access to all of my extended cut tech help videos, one free beginner class every month, and some other perks. Gold members, Get all the previous perks, plus access to download the sample databases that I build in my tech help videos, plus access to my code vault where I keep tons of different functions that I use, the code that I build in most of the videos. You'll also get higher priority if you do submit any tech help questions. 
Now, answers are never guaranteed, but you do go higher in the list for me to read them. And if I like your question, you got a good chance of it being answered. You'll also get one free expert level class each month after you've finished the beginner series. Platinum members get all the previous perks plus even higher priority for tech help questions. You get access to all of my full beginner level courses for every subject. And I cover lots of different subjects like Word, Excel, VBA, ASP, lots of different stuff, not just access. These are the full length courses found on my website. You get all the beginner ones. In addition, once you finish the expert classes, you get one free developer class per month. So lots of training. And finally, you can also become a diamond sponsor. You'll have your name or your company name listed on a sponsors page that will be shown on each video as long as you're a sponsor. You'll get a shout out in the video and a link to your website or product in the text below the video and on my website. So that's it. Once again, my name is Richard Rost. Thank you for watching this video brought to you by AccessLearningZone.com. I hope you enjoyed. I hope you learned something today. Live long and prosper, my friends. I'll see you again soon.